Andrew, thanks so much for joining us on Dark Mode. Pleasure to have you. Great to be here. Nice to see you, Gabe. Ben? Hey, Andrew, to kick off, I'm very excited, I mentioned offline there, to be both concurrently a host on this episode and an intent learner because Mm -hmm. I would love someone to explain to me the world of quantum computing. So you're our guy. I hope so. I'll do my best. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Would you be kind enough to tell us a little bit about your background and what you're working on at the moment? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I've been a, an academic at the University of New South Wales for over 25 years. And these days I'm a professor and also a Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow and have been working in the area of silicon-based quantum computing for the majority of that time. And also over the past few years, I've been working to spin out a company to commercialize that technology. And May last year, we launched the company Dirac, headquartered in Sydney, and where our main operations are based on the campus of the University of New South Wales. I remain as a professor at the university, but my substantive role is as CEO and founder of Dirac. Amazing. Congratulations on the launch. Yep, it's well. We're one year in now, so uh, it's it's real and it's it's all happening. And and of course, we're furiously juggling balls at the moment. Excited to Spinning follow plates, the journey. Juggling Andrew. balls, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, could you break down for us what quantum computing is? Mm-hmm. So, quantum computing involves the use of quantum particles or quantum systems. Um, which are generally, but not always, microscopic or subatomic objects. These can be single electrons or single photons. So these are quantum particles of which all matter is constructed. Uh, And quantum physics describes the way that these particles and systems operate at this microscopic level. And quantum computing is the use of those quantum particles to encode Um, bits of information, essentially zeros or ones, in some similarity to the way that conventional computers encode information, zeros and ones, using transistors on a silicon chip. But the difference between a standard bit of information, which is either zero or one, uh, a quantum bit can be in what's called a superposition of both zero and one at the same time. And in fact, it can actually exist in uh, any value in between zero or one. Um, And uh, it is this power of superposition that gives an inherent type of parallelism to quantum computing and makes uh, quantum computing uh, more powerful, uh, has more processing power for certain classes of computations or algorithms. Very cool. I am I going am to looking need at to listen Ben's. to that point zero zero five speed to learn about that. Uh, I appreciate the definition, Andrew. Andrew, you mentioned quantum particles in, in the introduction mm-hmm. there. Is mm-hmm. are we talking are we drawing back to Albert Einstein and the photoelectric effect? Or was that like 1905, 1906? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, where he's talking about the individual quantum particles. Are we is that a drawback to where quantum started and where we are today? Yeah, it was at that time. Einstein, as you mentioned, discovered or explained the photoelectric effect, but also around the same time, uh, scientists were beginning to learn about the structure of atoms and how atoms worked, that atoms were made up of a a, a nucleus um, with uh, negatively charged electrons around them and so on. But it was in the 1920s that the the theories that describe quantum mechanics um, were put together. And this was done by three um, Nobel Prize winning physicists, Werner Heisenberg, uh, who some people might know from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle was one of the founders. And the other two founders were Erwin Schrodinger. So if you've ever heard of Schrodinger's cat, that uh, so Schrodinger was based in Austria, Werner uh, Heisenberg in, in Germany. And, um, and the third person was Paul Dirac. And uh, Paul Dirac was British, born in Bristol, but to uh, Swiss parents. And uh, that's where the name of our company comes from, by the way, Dirac. Uh, and Schrodinger and Dirac jointly uh, got the Nobel Prize together in 1933, eventually. But most of the theories were developed 
um, in the um, early to mid 1920s. And uh, interestingly, each of Schrodinger, Dirac and Heisenberg came up with slightly different mathematical ways to describe the same thing. So, uh, so yes, it, it, it's absolutely about subatomic particles. I mean, the, the image behind me is meant to represent fuzzy electron so-called wave functions um, inside one of our silicon chips. And the arrows are meant to represent a property of the uh, electrons, which are le is less familiar to most people. Most, well, many people, if you think back, if you did science or indeed if you ever even did physics at high school, you'd certainly remember that electrons have negative charge, negative electric charge. Electrons also have an extra property, which is a tiny magnetic, magnetic field. And so the arrows you can think of as the North Pole or the South Pole of a compass needle. So they've got a tiny magnetic field associated with them. And, and that comes from a property known as their spin. So one way to think about it, it's not completely accurate, is thinking about the electron charge kind of rotating on its axis and that produces a magnetic field. That's one way to think about it. It's not completely accurate, but it gives a bit of an idea of what this property of spin is. And for the type of qubits uh, that our company Dirac is interested in, electron spin qubits, we, we encode the quantum information on this um, tiny magnetic field. So for example, if the arrow is pointing up, the magnetic field pointing north, we could call that a one. And if it's pointing downwards, you can call that a zero. And that's how you encode a, a bit of information on a single electron. But I should emphasize that that's just one way of making a quantum computer or a quantum bit you could encode it in a, uh, a single particle of light, like a photon. A photon's a single particle of light, and you could encode it in, for example, the polarization state of that fo photon. All right, but many other ways to do it. That was gonna be my follow-up question is, how then do you get quantum mechanics into quantum computing? I see in my, I'm gonna go little brain theory, that light makes sense and the nuns and ones, but there's other ways to do it? That's right. I mentioned electron spins or, or photons. Yeah. Um, you can also, what, one of the most popular ways that's being explored at the moment, including by companies such as uh, Google and IBM and some other startups in the field, they use uh, uh, superconducting materials, which they deposit on a chip into a, a circuit. So for example, you could have a, a ring of superconducting material and it turns out that the current, the supercurrent in that ring can either flow clockwise or anti-clockwise. That's, that's one simple way of thinking about it. And it turns out that this is actually a macroscopic object. So it's still, you know, these are maybe 100 microns across. So much, much bigger than a single electron, but it turns out that these superconducting states are also describe well by quantum mechanics. And so you can get a superposition of these two states. So, I mean, in fact, bearing in mind that all of matter in the universe is described by the rules of quantum mechanics and made up of quantum particles, you, it's almost limitless the number of different systems that in theory could be used as a quantum bit of information. It turns out though, that when there are certain requirements you need for quantum bits to be useful for quantum computing. So you need to be able to control them to change a zero to a one and back again. You need to be able to read out, measure the state of the quantum bit, whether it is a one or a zero. You need to be able to connect two together to perform logical operations and so on. And so these types of requirements that were summarized about two decades ago uh, by a, a scientist called David DiVincenzo, often this is called the DiVincenzo criteria for quantum computing, sort of determine what makes a good quantum bit. And so while there's in theory almost an infinite number of possible systems that could be used for quantum computing, these days there's about five or six that are currently being looked at seriously by both research organizations and commercial entities like ourselves. What's your sense, Andrew, on how mature we are in this realm? Have we still got a bit to go? Is there still more scientific discovery that needs to be had? What's the commercialization look like? This is a general state of play at the moment, mm -hmm. perhaps both domestically and internationally, if you could give us that picture as well. Yeah, so um, 
There's definitely more scientific research and a lot more engineering to do in order to reveal the promise of quantum computing. So to, to kind of give you a bit of a timeline, the first ideas of using quantum states for computing came from the uh, very early 1980s from a, another Nobel Prize winner, Richard Feynman, who first posited the idea of using quantum particles for computing, representing that the, recognizing there are certain problems where quantum particles would be inherently better than conventional bits to do computing. The first algorithm that really was a bit of a killer app for quantum computing, which is to find the prime factors of a large composite number, that was discovered by a guy called Peter Shaw in 1994. And Shaw, this particular algorithm sounds esoteric, but actually that problem is at the heart of all public key encryption algorithms. So people might be aware that um, a full scale quantum computer would be capable of cracking existing public key encryption codes, which are used in most e-commerce, which obviously creates a potential security risk when these are available. To give you a sense, so we're talking about ideas that are between you know 30 and 40 years old. In Australia, the Centre for Quantum Computing was established by um, the gentleman who recruited me to UNSW back in 2000. So the Center for Quantum Computer Technology, now the Center for Quantum Computing and Communication Technology, which has been running for now uh, 24 years. So it's been a long journey of scientific discovery. And it's really only been in the last, let's say five to eight years that corporations and startups have really started to get into the field and to develop more and more sophisticated quantum processing systems for people to use. The most advanced these days have, let's say, up to around 100 quantum bits or slightly less. And so there are companies like IBM and Google uh, and others that, are, um, that have developed these systems, have done demonstrations of calculations using them. And indeed, for companies like IBM and other systems. There's also technologies based on trapped ions, for example, a company called IonQ and a number, a number of others in that area, which provide access to their systems. And at this moment, you can buy time on those quantum computers and use them to um, test out operate running algorithms, running, running problems on them. At this stage, though, it's still the case that there's no clear cut demonstrations of a quantum computing system that exceeds the capability of an existing powerful computer, uh, conventional computer. And it's generally viewed that in order to really significantly surpass existing computers across a range of problems, one is going to need a great many more quantum bits than 100. In fact, the number that is generally banded about is millions of qubits are going to be required. And so the race is very much on to design and build quantum computers up at that level. And everyone from different companies, from different research groups will have different views on exactly how long it'll take to reach that point. My personal view is that it's going to take at least a decade to get to many millions. Um, I think that we can be looking at hundreds of thousands in around five years. Uh, but um, uh, I think the really, really big applications that are going to generate um, very, very significant global impacts and commercial impacts will probably be closer to one decade from now. I do want to emphasize, though, that there are already, as I mentioned, uh, companies that provide services on these computers. We're looking to do it very soon as well. And there is a commercial market at the moment for using these quantum computers to start to explore um, what, what is possible. Very cool, Ben. Andrew, you're... yeah, you mentioned buying time <laughs> to run problems on current systems. I have plenty of problems. I'm not sure that it can be run on quantum computing though. <laughs> Um, as it relates to, as it pertains to the, the practical effect of quantum computing on people, you mentioned that 10 years to get to, you know, anticipated 10 years to get to moons of qubits. What are some of the practical applications that our audience might be impacted by in terms mm -hmm. of that evolution of quantum computing? Yeah. So um, 
one of the most exciting opportunities is the ability for quantum computers to um, simulate the way that other quantum systems behave. So that might sound initially esoteric, but you have to appreciate that all molecules, um, including the molecules that make up chemicals that we use every day in chemical processing, but also the um, biological systems that make up human life, um, those are all quantum systems. The, the description of how the molecules fit together or the proteins fold and so on, uh, to understand those properly, you need quantum mechanics. And, and only um, a quantum computer is able to properly simulate the way these chemicals or molecules interact with each other. And it was actually going right back to the very conception of quantum computing. It was Richard Feynman, who I mentioned earlier, that proposed the idea that using quantum systems to simulate other quantum systems like molecules would open up um, an entire new range of discovery possibilities for humanity. So what do I mean by that? So I mean that we could, for example, consider designing new pharmaceuticals to attack a particular virus or to attack a particular bacteria. At the moment, the way that, the way that researchers who, who work in biotechnology um, develop new pharmaceuticals is largely by trial and error and guesswork. This can be very, very lengthy um, and be extremely costly. We saw with COVID um, in recent times, a remarkable effort by the world of scientists coming together um, to rapidly find a vaccine. But I think everyone's aware about um, what an existential crisis that was for humanity and how much effort and time and money went into solving that problem. I mean, we can't do that for every disease and for every um, ailment. But um, the prospect of quantum computing is that these quantum computers ultimately have the potential to find solutions, to find the right um, the right vaccines for particular viruses and, and other bacteria. So, I mean, for me, I consider that one of the most exciting opportunities, but that, that's just one example. Another example is to find more efficient ways to do chemical processing. Now, remember that, you know, most of uh, what we eat, most of the fertilizers we use, um, most of the plastics or any materials that we use are generally the result of chemical processes. And, and chemical processing of materials consumes a huge amount of energy on the planet at the moment. So if we can find more efficient ways to do that, then we can, can also look at reducing energy consumption for the planet, which is obviously of great importance uh, for the climate. Other possibilities, for example, include designing particular um, uh, catalysts that could uh, sequester um, carbon dioxide or methane in order to um, help fight uh, the risks of, of climate change. So, um, and those are just some examples. I mean, really the prospects are endless when you start to think about the ability to design new materials, more lightweight materials that, that can make uh, planes lighter, but still strong that can then reduce energy costs and power consumption. New designs for battery technology with electric cars at the moment, you know, it's a great change, but the batteries are very heavy. If we can design new types of batteries with more efficient, um, lighter batteries, that would be a game changer as well. So it's really this ability of quantum computers to design new molecular systems to solve a whole range of problems uh, that, that is one of the most uh, significant. And, and that's just one class, probably the most exciting class. Uh, we then have the ability of quantum computers to uh, solve analytical problems, um, for example, optimization problems in order to find more efficient ways to do things. This could be, for example, for financial modeling and so on. So there's a lot of interest from finance companies to, to uh, explore the use of quantum computers. There is um, applications in uh, um, optimization of routing, for example, finding the most efficient um, logistical paths um, that can be important for, um, you know, courier companies or airlines, delivery services, 
um, also um, for military applications in that area as well with logistics optimization. And then there's a whole class of uh, potential in quantum based machine learning where there's the potential for quantum computing to also enhance machine learning and, art and potentially artificial intelligence. So a huge range of applications. Mm -hmm. There's really quite a universal application for quantum computing, quantum mechanics, as you described before, Andrew. It seems like it's definitely that next real significant frontier of, of technological advancement. I do want to make one qualification and, and, and make sure that it's, it's very clear that um, quantum computers and quantum algorithms, while they, in theory, can actually solve any particular algorithm you may have. For a lot of standard algorithms, um, they wouldn't be more efficient than a conventional computer. So it's particular classes of problems where they will have an advantage. And that is a subset of the broad range of problems. So it, it I mean, I, I don't ever like to predict things, but I don't think you necessarily gonna use it in a word processor. It might help you with some translation perhaps in the future, but a lot of the basic things that we use in computing um, don't need quantum computing. So I think the way to think of quantum computing is it's an add-on to go into areas that currently um, are, are difficult for existing computers. Um, there may be some areas where it provides some benefit of speed up on, algor on algorithms that are used more commonly, but there's also a huge class of, of um, problems and algorithms where it won't apply at all. So it, it'll be a game changer in some areas, but it, it isn't going to replace all computing. I think it's important people will appreciate. Yeah, certainly Very is an important piece to it. Yeah, Andrew, you mentioned, I wanna play devil's advocate here a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, does it pose an existential risk in terms of bio warfare, chemical warfare, uh, and some of the adverse effects of what quantum computing is capable of? Well, my view is that whenever a new uh, transformational technology is developed, um, there are both opportunities and risks associated with it. Um, uh, by definition, if something is transformational, it can be used both for positive reasons and for negative reasons. Um, so yes, I think that there are risks and there are risks that, that have to be uh, managed carefully through appropriate um, uh, legislation, through regulation and so on. And I can say that um, there are already quite active groupings looking at these issues right now, certainly in Australia. Um, there's been a number of um, discussions already within our uh, so-called, we have a Sydney Quantum Academy made up of uh, the four large universities in Sydney that have grouped together with uh, expertise in quantum. And they've been looking at this issue. This is being done globally as well. One, one thing that I would say is that we're probably being given a very, uh, the quantum field is being given a, a great opportunity for watching the AI field at the moment. Artificial intelligence is an area that also has incredible opportunities um, to benefit mankind, but also very considerable potential risks. And uh, quite clearly, this is one of the biggest topics of discussion. I'm sure you've discussed it on dark mode about um, the risks and how to legislate, regulate, um, uh, how to um, manage a technology that is potentially so game changing for humanity. And I think that quantum is some years, quantum computing is some years behind artificial intelligence in terms of really making a global game changing impact. And so we have an opportunity to watch how that is managed and legislated. I think that it's going, I mean, that is that is a very good example to be, to be watching and, and thinking about. Let's trust that we get it right. <laughs> well, let's hope I'm so. Sure. No, it's, no yeah. well, I, I hope so. It's uh, it, it's not a given. It's um, I do think that it is going to require um, very very careful thinking and um, and and um, I'm pleased to see that you know governments and and corporations now are are really starting to pay serious attention to this issue. Yeah, Andrew, the, uh, we... the AI conversation. Sorry, Gabe, just quickly. The AI conversation is interesting in that the consumer consumption of consumer consumption is that like an atm machine 
uh, <laughs> has has gone uh, pretty rogue recently, and the quantum world is able to look at that. But for what I didn't realize until this morning is the heritage and the foundations of quantum computing dialing back to quantum mechanics. There's a foundation and a history there of over a hundred plus years of knowledge to get to the point we are today. So uh, I feel like if if there is a pivotal moment in technological advancement, quantum's going to do it right and has the foundations to support doing it right. Look, uh, that might be a, um, uh, it's, it's nice to say that, but you can equally say that the history of computing goes back, you know, to the 1940s and 50s as well. Um, I, don't, I don't think that quantum scientists or engineers have any uh, monopoly on, um, you know, astute judgment in terms of uh, geopolitical or, or moral factors. I think that um, uh, it's, it, it, the, the issues ultimately are moral ethical and and political factors that need to be taken into account and we you know we've all got to think about these things very carefully andrew i wanted to go back to dirac if we could mm -hmm. very interested in uh you know very you happy to talk about our company yep yeah yep. of course yeah in preparation for this episode we're looking at th what dirac's purpose is and uh, if i just read out some of the verbiage on your linkedin which is mm -hmm. to redefine mm -hmm. scalable quantum computing and bring practical commercial applications mm -hmm. to the world via billions of qubits on a single chip compared to the hundreds that exist today as you were just describing before so mm -hmm. what what is that promise of configuring the end-to-end -end quantum quantum computer and how do you see that as the ceo and founder of dirac in particular mm. so um as I mentioned, I, I've worked in the field for over two decades and um, had been looking at a variety of different ways to do quantum computing using silicon-based devices. And um, just a reminder for the audience that uh, silicon is the material used um, in 99.9% .9 of computer chips and chips that we use in our phones for communications and so on for processing and storing data. I've been particularly interested over that two decades in trying to think about a way to make very, very large numbers of qubits in a reliable, reproducible way that can be manufactured as straightforwardly as possible. And so um, we began to explore using or modifying existing silicon transistor devices in order to act as quantum bits um, about a decade and a half ago. So for people who aren't familiar with transistors, uh, transistors are, um, they were developed uh, essentially in the 1940s, initially based on another semiconductor, semiconductor material known as germanium. But soon after that, silicon became the dominant semiconductor and, and, most, transist and all trans most transistors these days are made out of silicon. Um, essentially, a, a transistor is a tiny switch. It uses, in fact, the, the, if you can see the picture above my head, that shiny metal thing is meant to represent a, a metal, um, uh, a metallic uh, electrode that sits on the surface of a transistor. And then you have a, an insulating region underneath that metal gate. And then underneath that, um, if you put positive, a positive voltage on the gate, you draw negative electrons underneath. And in a transistor switch, when the voltage on the gate is positive, it draws electrons in and it turns the transistor on. It connects the circuit from one contact to another. Transistor is a three terminal device. So what we showed and first experimentally demonstrated in 2014 was that we could reduce the electrons inside one of those transistors just to one or a small number of electrons. And we showed that we could store information on a single electron and read out that state. So the significance of that, uh, and then and then the next year we showed that we could put two of those transistors next to each other, two of those devices next to each other. Sometimes we generally call quantum dots in the scientific community because it's a very small region where the electrons are held. And we showed that we could interact, we could perform logic operations between the electrons sitting under those two devices. The beauty of this is that um, we can then make these devices using the same manufacturing plants that we use to make silicon chips. So one thing that uh, many, many people 
who carry around phones and rely on them for so much today, you know, are often blissfully unaware of the fact that inside this phone, we have um, a, a chip that has over a billion silicon transistors on, you know, on around about one square centimetre of silicon. Arguably, and I think strongly arguably, it's the most sophisticated piece of engineering that's ever been invented by mankind because all of these billions of transistors have to work reliably, have to work in a coordinated way to do very complex calculations. So when we developed the silicon so-called CMOS quantum bit, um, it was because we wanted to utilize that manufacturing technology. And indeed, that's what we, we've been, what we focus on with our company Dirac. So at the moment, um, we are working with um, some global chip making foundries, both manufacturing and R&D foundries, um, in order to translate the technology that we've demonstrated in our laboratories on the campus of uh, UNSW in Sydney, and uh, get that translated into a manufacturing process that can then make ultimately many millions of quantum bits on a chip using the same chip making technology. I mentioned earlier that in order to really unlock the potential of quantum computers to, to solve those sort of problems I talked about, like pharmaceutical design and so on, we are going to need millions of quantum bits. And in, in my personal view, it's only using uh, silicon technology, which is already a proven technology for that level of reproducibility that, that will be helpful. I should mention that one of the other advantages of this technology is that because we're using the same materials, the same devices effectively for the quantum bits as are used for standard transistors, we can also integrate so-called classical or conventional um, switching and electronics, which are required in order to manipulate the quantum bits. So a, a quantum computer also needs a lot of conventional computing to control very sophisticated operations on the on the quantum chip. And so that's one of the uh, main uh, aims of our company to integrate the conventional electronics with the quantum electronics. Very cool. Gabe, okay, awesome. I want to share something from uh, the Dirac yeah. uh, Twitterverse, mm -hmm. um, yep. which Let's I found really cool. Uh, can mm -hmm. you see that one coming up? Talk us through this yeah. one, Andrew. This, And I'm just reading the tweet here because I think it's mm -hmm. fascinating and I know nothing beyond what the tweet says, mm -hmm. but it's a jelly bean shaped quantum dot that creates more breathing space in a microchip packed with qubits. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what we're looking at right here? And this is this blows my mind. This is some of the coolest innovation coming out of Australia right now in terms of quantum computing. Very and cool. Hmm. Yeah, so this, this was some work um, done in our team where... So the, the blue circles are meant to represent the electron wave functions that, can, that maintain the spin a little bit like the things um, on the screen behind my head. And um, the jelly bean shaped object in the middle um, represents a region of the device where you can put lots of extra electrons and they act as essentially a link between the qubits at either end. The idea is that in a super dense processor, you'd have all of the electrons, the, the, the bright blue circles right next to each other. That would be an ideal super dense array of electron spin quantum bits. But the closer they are to, that these are very small, you have to appreciate that, you know, the size of one of these quantum dots is only around 20 uh, nanometers or so. And so when you pack them all together, it can be very difficult to get all of the wires that connect to these electrodes in order to do the manipulation. So the idea of this so-called jelly bean device is to move things apart a little bit to get more room to allow the wires to get in. So it's these issues about um, the best ways to, to do the integration on the integrated circuit or silicon chip this particular um, solution has been developed in order to make that easier and, and to bring the technology forward faster. I understood about a minute of that, but it is amazing. I can't Indeed. believe how small <laughs> one of those dots is, Andrew. That is, that's wild. They, they are, but, you know, I think it's important to appreciate that, um, that, on the most advanced chips being made, for example, by either TSMC or Samsung or, or, or Intel, 
the feature sizes of the transistors are now approaching five nanometers. Okay, so there are features wow. on that chip at the five nanometer level. And there is actually a plan to reduce those things even further to two nanometers. Now, to give people an appreciation of how small that is, if you take a hair from your head, the diameter of a human hair is around about 50 um, microns, okay? Five zero microns, okay? Now, most transistors on the most advanced chips these days are smaller than five zero nanometers. So a typical transistor device is at least one thousandth of the width of a human hair. Okay, I mean, that's how we get a billion of them onto a square centimeter. So, so, I mean, the thing to understand is the ability to make devices at this level is now used every day. And, you know, many thousands of these chips, we wouldn't be having this conversation on this video stream without that technology. That is, that's what underpins it all. So this technology for making the small devices is here now. The thing that we're developing is, in a sense, modifying that technology in such a way to be able to operate with the quantum systems as well. Amazing. Andrew, are you looking for any investors? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, private conversation on the side. <laughs> we're, we're, we're always very happy to talk to investors. We've, we're, we're, um, we're currently uh, involved in a, in a, a current round of uh, new fundraising for the company, and, and that's progressing very well at the moment. But always, if there are people interested, we're always happy to talk. Take a look on the website, contact details, andrew at direct.com. So very easy to be reached. Love it. Maybe part of the uh, dark mode fund, Ben. Throw it yes. in there. <laughs> Throw, Throw it in good. there. <laughs> That's awesome, Andrew. Thanks for your insights. Is there anything else quantum related that you wanted to mention um, as we wrap up the episode? Maybe just that, um, that you know, Australia is a great place to be doing uh, quantum technology. The Chief Scientist of Australia and the Industry Minister recently released the National Quantum Strategy um, for Australia. Uh, the, uh, in Sydney in particular, we've got a fantastic concentration of uh, quantum scientists and engineers. It's one of the uh, largest concentrations in any city in the world, which is in part because of the fact that we started very early. So the, the Centre for Quantum Computing that, that I'm part of, that I mentioned earlier, to my knowledge, was the world's first national centre you know, that brought together universities around Australia. So Australia um, is in a very good position. I should mention, though, that um, the rest of the world, to some extent, has been catching up and, and, and certainly on the commercial level, slightly surpassing Australia over the last few years. There have been massive investments from different nation states around the world. And, um, but it's, it's really great that the current chief scientist, Cathy Foley, and the industry minister, Ed Husick, you know, they clearly ha have a desire to support this technology. And uh, it's a very important time to make sure that companies like ours, but there are other companies um, in Australia in this space, many other companies that, um, you know, have great potential to, to build a, a quantum economy here in Australia and build global, global success stories, hopefully. Oh, that's amazing. Ben, how many times we hear just Australia being on the frontier of a lot of these advancements? It's always so cool to hear, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, very cool. Andrew, thanks so much for your time on Dark Mode. Really appreciate your insights and looking forward to continuing to follow the journey. Been an absolute Absolutely. pleasure, Gabe and Ben. Really enjoyed it. Take care, guys. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or leave us a rating on your favourite podcast platform. See you on the next episode of Dark Mode.